Okay, thank you very much, Tatiana, and uh, good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, it's an honor for me to speak today. Uh, and I will talk about an inconvenient topic. This inconvenience uh, is connected with the contestation of the, uh, of the concept of Europeanization. <clears throat> approximately, well, around uh, the Velvet Revolutions in 88, 89, and the uh, post-Soviet revolution in 91, the Europeanization became, uh, at the same time, partially the scientific term, the term of social sciences, humanities, uh, legal sciences, and uh, on the other uh, hand, it's, it's been an ideological term. It's connected with the overarching idea of post-communist uh, transformation or post-communist transit, which was usually described in the 90s as consisting of three elements. One is democratization. It was about the change in the nature of the political processes, political systems, also legal systems in uh, uh, post-communist societies from uh, Prague to uh, Vladivostok. The second element of uh, post-communist transition was uh, marketization, creation of the class of owners, creation of the private sphere, the, the change of communist or post-communist societies into those that have both public and private spheres institutionalized and uh, vibrant. But the third important element of the post-communist transition was Europeanization. It was a specific term that combined both elements of uh, economy, elements of politics, of law, but also some deeper values, the meaning that everything, uh, all, all the societies come together. And uh, the, this uh, term that had also well, academic, scientific, and ideological, political uh, undertones became contested uh, very soon. And I would like to look at this term uh, in, in the nature of its contestation. And also because it's being used today, uh, all these uh, different elements, to undermine uh, the, the uh, legitimacy of many European or Europe-oriented uh, political regimes, political systems, or uh, countries and nations in, in general. So uh, uh, I would say that this uh, Europeanization uh, term consisting of many contradictory elements is being used in today's uh, discursive wars. However, uh, it's, it should be uh, also taken into account that this is a living term and it was changing its nature. So Europeanization first was seen as some merger of legal and political systems uh, in the East and in the West around the core values of the Council of Europe. But later Europe started, uh, they changed the meaning and it was more applied to European Union and the so-called Euro-Atlantic or NATO integration. So you, you see how the political agenda behind the term was also changing. So uh, today we will talk about the ideological role of the term and how it can be used by the, uh, in these hybrid conflicts and hybrid, uh, hybrid uh, hybrid wars that uh, many uh, experts talking about. So I would divide the, the change of contestation and the meaning of the Europeanization concept <laughs> between 1989-91 up until today. And I, th I see like three or three periods or the four uh, milestones in, bet in between and first the first milestone uh, of this concept was the denial of Marxist socialism and reintegration of Europe as one continent based on common values. 
around the uh, Council of Europe agenda as, uh, as a region, as a continent uh, of peace and mutual cooperation. So the, the idea at this time was connected with the end of Cold War and reconciliation of all European uh, nations from Lisbon or from Dublin till Vladivostok. This uh, pacifist democratic uh, uh, idea was only part of the general agenda. And uh, to some extent, it had its life for several decades. Then in the beginning of 21st century, one can see that uh, integration into European Union and enlargement of European Union started changing the, the, this role. By, by the beginning of 21st century, first of all, uh, Europe as one continent indeed was created. Almost all countries uh, on the continent war became a part of the Council of Europe. They, they became uh, and uh, accepted many legal norms into their uh, national legal systems. So it was very important step. But in the beginning of 21st century, especially by 2004, with this wave of new members entering EU, uh, integration or Europeanization started meaning mainly uh, merging or entering the accession to EU and Euro-Atlantic structures. However, this overarching and uh, collective uh, European identity was still in place and the uh, possible role of Russia, of post-Soviet states in the Europeanization was still acknowledged. Well, by 2011, by 2013, 14, when the European, uh, when the Ukrainian uh, conflict started, uh, integration into EU and Euro-Atlantic structures and association with EU and uh, NATO uh, became the guiding principle of Europeanization. And uh, it was also the moment when integratory processes in the West and integratory processes around Russia and Russia-driven projects uh, were becoming uh, irreconcilable. So this gap between the two projects that were seen sometime before as possible uh, way of uh, integration of European continent and of all European nations into some one uh, continental structure was slowly disappearing. And 2013, 2014, conflict in Ukraine, war in Ukraine, and all the uh, security challenges for the entire continent were stemming from this uh, conflicting nature of two uh, integratory projects in the East and in the West. Finally, by today, this cooperation with EU and Europeanization starts, uh, has so many different uh, meanings. Uh, and at the same time, Europeanization is, can be promoted in the East of Europe uh, with no realistic membership perspective or uh, as a conflict with Russia and uh, Russia-led uh, projects and Russian allies, uh, it's one of the meanings. But also Europeanization is being contested already by new players. For example, the Trumpist uh, United States or the Brexited uh, United Kingdom or Turkey. So uh, from within of NATO, uh, Europeanization is a contested term. It's not only from Russia or from uh, from Russia. Uh, so once again, the, the, the first period, so the, the first uh, decade uh, of the Europeanization term uh, was seen as the end of division between the West and the East and the continent. Uh, one big Europe project uh, coincided also with a conservative, a more conservative interpretation already at this time. So it was called a return to Europe. You probably remember that it was one of the ideological posits 
used also in Ukraine or even in, in, in Russia or even in Belarus or in those countries where they, they turn uh, to uh, authoritarianism was very early. But return to Europe was used by local conservative forces, nationalists as well, to return to uh, pre-1939 uh, agenda. So there, there was important uh, establishing equ equality, ideological equality between communism and Nazism and fascism. And then the, the idea was that um, the Central European, but also Eastern European nations should return to Europe, but also to Europe that was before all these um, totalitarian uh, experiments. So in a way, the interwar period, which was never a uh, period of vibrant democracies. So in a way, if uh, one big Europe and Council of Europe agenda was mainly liberal demo democratic agenda, the return to Europe tended to conservative and uh, ethno-nationalist uh, uh, interpretation of the same ideology or ideological posit. Then uh, this uh, period, th this period uh, was leading to the next decade where Europe was mainly seen as common project vested into European Union. It's interesting that for, uh, at this period be, between uh, 89 and 2001, uh, Europe was going through two different uh, processes. In the West, it's reintegration, it's deepening integration. And in the West, the complex, uh, uh, the, the complex uh, states were disintegrating. So in a way, this disintegration uh, uh, of Soviet Union, of Czechoslovakia, of Yugoslav Federation was leading to creation of new uh, political entities and new nations, which uh, after that immediately uh, had an intention of integrating into European uh, EU structures and into Eurozone. So there were several waves of 2004, 2008, later, which were very important uh, steps in integration of Western and Central Europe, while the East of Europe was slowly becoming marginalized. And also there, there was a, a many dividing lines, including Schengen zone and, and so on. So uh, Eastern Central Europe had to reinvent itself as Central Europe. Uh, you, you know that this ideological process where not the East was very important for also self-esteem of uh, many uh, new European nations that call themselves now as Central Europe in Czech Republic, in Slovakia, in Hungary. But at the same time, this change of um, uh, geographic imagination uh, was also connected with some strange uh, shadow agenda of Euroscepticism. So in a way to become integrated into Western Europe did not necessarily mean to integrate really. It was rather to um, distance from the dangerous East and also to create some uh, sort of uh, isolated or sovereignized uh, nation. And you can see the sovereignty of today in Poland or in Hungary uh, blooming. Uh, this post-Soviet Europe was re-emerging as new uh, Eastern Europe, a, a new uh, region and uh, it's six uh, recognized today and six non-recognized states with, uh, with different understanding what it is from uh, the Western Europe uh, point of view, it's Eastern neighborhood. Uh, locally, this, uh, th this region is divided into authoritarian uh, regimes and hybrid regimes that at certain moments tend to become more democratic and free, at certain moments less democratic, more authoritarian, or uh, more uh, uh, anarch anarchic. 
And uh, this division is not only ideological or systemic, but also it creates uh, conflicts between the nations or uh, it adds to the conflict between Ukraine and Russia currently. So uh, and at the same time in, in Europe, at large in, in, in West of the Europe, in European Union and in other European countries, Euroscepticism was also growing and uh, emerging into strong political forces. Uh, finally, in, in the last decade, uh, Europe uh, was losing its, uh, its Western uh, parts, especially United Kingdom. The Brexit was very painful for, uh, for the family of European Union nations. Uh, and at the same time, Europe was forced from being a, an economic player, an economically integrated player into more and more political player. And uh, this is uh, why this, the role of geopolitical player means that Europe should become more integrated and that the Brussels would uh, get more security and uh, hard politics instruments, which is opposed by many national, uh, many national elites. So the, 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 there were two major uh, conflict partners in Europe for the European Union in the form of Russia and Turkey in, in this uh, that period. And uh, Europe, uh, still has a political and security challenges with Russia and Turkey, but at the same time, uh, as economic power, it's interested in, in trade relations with the both. So the, also being part of the collective West, EU uh, starts feeling that uh, belonging to this collective does not necessarily mean uh, respect to the EU interests. So in a, may, in a way, Europe, uh, Europeanization is changing uh, the, the nature of EU and the, the conflict, internal conflict between economic and political and security issues. And also realpolitik uh, of EU uh, is less and less uh, has to do with legal or uh, with um, value uh, issues and more about security and more about economy. Uh, altogether uh, was summarized by Richard Youngs, whom I uh, applaud for, for his uh, wonderful uh, paper, analytical paper, which was published in, by the Center of European Policy Studies, the new patchwork politics for wider Europe. Here, uh, Richard actually analyzed how the term of Europeanization is being used around 2019-2020. And he uh, uh, offered like these four categories that today add to this fragmentation of the idea of Europe and European integration. So there is a form of residual Europeanization which is this residual elements of the idea of 89-91. So this ideological posit of more liberty, of more individualism, of more freedom, of more uh, rule of law. And uh, it uh, still is active part, important part of the Europeanization, uh, of Europeanization um, concept with uh, transitional and democratic gravity towards EU, but it's less and less so. So it's a weakening element. There's also a stronger uh, element, which is which um, Richard calls uh, political ne politically neutral Europeanization, which is quite an influential practice uh, that can form real politic or real uh, real political processes. But it's, it is detached from macro level political trends and it has both democratic and anti-democratic ways it, and it can support political forces 
in uh, Europe, uh, in United Europe, in European Union, or in um, the Eastern neighborhood that are of very different natures, including anti-democratic forces of uh, oligarchic clans. There's also directly anti-democratic Europeanization element, uh, which is uh, used by illiberal forces and uh, Richard uh, describes it as illiberal trends within the EU that are giving oxygen to liberal actors in wider European space. And uh, that's an important element, usually in this uh, ideological discussions, uh, Europeanization uh, tries to hide this element, but it's, it's there and the illiberal turn uh, in EU in Central European countries uh, in Baltic countries, they, they are, it, it is there, and uh, an honest discussion, an understanding of internal conflicts, also ideological conflicts, need to respect reality and this element of the uh, Europeanization uh, concept. And finally, there's also this contradictory practice and the element uh, of, of the Europeanization concept, which Richard correctly calls reverse Europeanization. It's the practice in wider Europe where the EU and its policies develop uh, decreasing re relevance. So, the, the, for example, um, in 2019, the, the victory of Volodymyr Zelensky by many was seen as this type of reverse Europeanization in order to, to develop Ukraine and Ukrainian uh, voters we're looking for some leader that is not connected directly with the Europeanization process. Well, this is very important uh, and honest analysis, which was giving us uh, also a lot of uh, conceptual thinking behind the, the, uh, the, the, the concept of Europeanization. And now I, I would finish with the three major dividing lines uh, that are today uh, contest Euro uh, the, the Europeanization um, concept directly, and which is used also uh, by ideological propagandist um, and discursive uh, uh, conflict in discursive conflicts. It's Euroscepticism within EU, Euroscepticism promoted by Russia and Turkey, and Euroscepticism. Uh, within one big collective West. So Euroscepticism within EU is well studied. It's well measured also uh, in terms of electoral results. For example, in 2019 EU elections, the pro-EU parties were mainly winning, but you, you can see that there are several uh, societies, uh, European societies, which were already more and more Eurosceptic. And of course, there's uh, the, the loss of uh, United Kingdom. The, there are established political parties uh, in uh, EU nations, like in France, National Front, now National Rally, Germany, uh, Germany's alternative for Germany, Italy's both left and uh, right populist, um, populist nations in Hungary, uh, pop populist forces, five star, Cinque Stelle, five star movements, and Northern League, Lega Nord. Then Hungary, Fidesz, uh, Sweden, Swedish Democrats, Austrian Freedom Party, and uh, the Greeks, Golden Dawn. But Euroscepticism is also a part of foreign policy by Russia and Turkey. Uh, as you know, already this year we had two symbolic acts, which probably show the, the, the bigger picture. So the, the Borel incident in uh, Moscow, when there was a basic symbolic slam in the face, showing that Russia as uh, a state today is uh, in deep and comprehensive conflict with the United Europe. At the same time, Russia establishes and uh, supports the uh, political and um, economic uh, ties with uh, individual uh, European member states. 
So in a way, Russia, the, the way Russia acts is to undermine the European U uh, Union's unity. And here, this Euroscepticism and contestation of uh, Europeanization is going in this way. Also, Russia promotes anti-European and Eurosceptic uh, uh, policies in uh, European, in Eastern neighborhood and in uh, other post-Soviet nations. At the same tur uh, time, Turkey is um, uh, also a European, not only uh, Near East uh, political force. Turkey is part of the continent, uh, of the nations of the continent, uh, an old associ associated um, member of, of a, a country that is in association with EU and has very strong economic ties. But in this recent event against um, uh, Ms. von der Leyen, uh, that there was a slam in the face to the United European Union, also with the conservative uh, undertone. So two men, patriarchal, macho-style politicians, have a seat while the a woman uh, politician doesn't. And uh, this conservative uh, agenda that um, Erdogan's uh, Turkey promotes is a very important message for all the patriarchal or all the uh, extreme uh, conservative forces in Europe uh, was visible. But also Turkey has a very strong, uh, very strong um, ethnic network or the, the Turkish network of, uh, of diaspora in, in many countries around Europe, especially in Germany. Uh, and that's uh, important to remember that uh, it's one of the uh, tools for, uh, for, for uh, Turkey to fight with Europe. But uh, there's also internal division within the West that promotes uh, this um, change in the Europeanization concept or the emotions, <coughs> sorry, emotions that are awoken <clears throat> by the, this concept. So during the Trumpist uh, rule in US, the fragmentation of the West was visible so that in 2020, at the Munich Security Forum, the idea of Westlessness, so the loss of the West, its geopolitical core role was already uh, seen as a threat to democracy and uh, to the international order globally. However, uh, this uh, Euroscepticism promoted uh, by some groups uh, from the United States has changed recently. So th today, the idea of uh, Biden's administration is to reconsolidate the West. And it also contests this uh, Europeanization that was reimagined in recent years. Europeanization as creation of EU with many speeds, more uh, integrated, less integrated members and associated countries. But also uh, uh, EU was looking at the need to create its own security forces, troops, uh, uh, having stronger united foreign policy, and now this reconsolidation of the West may mean uh, also a conflict around these plans. Also the, the Brexit, which I mentioned, adds to the European divide. Now the independent uh, the foreign policy and security uh, interests of United Kingdom may be different uh, from those of the EU. Still, uh, United Kingdom is very important player and has a, an outreach to Turkey, to Central European countries that may also uh, undermine or uh, create a new front line or contestation, contestation line in understanding what United Europe and Europeanization means. And again, the, the, the very need for EU to have more uh, integrated 
deeper integration and security. It also influences uh, the way the values of one Europe are understood. And now the uh, as a uh, continent with deep, with many deep uh, conflicts, and also the war, ongoing war in Ukraine, these elements, these united elements of the Euro uh, Europeanization concept are being used uh, in these discursive wars. So I uh, end with the uh, conclusions that the idea of Europe is now under pressure. Uh, one uh, Europe, Europeanization as positive, uh, liberal, democratic process. Uh, this pressure comes from uh, the conflict between Brussels and uh, EU member states uh, nationally. It's not of all of them, but with some of them. Uh, conflict between EU's economic and political aims and conflict between Euro optimists and Euro skeptics that also look at the multi speed Europe with different opinions. There's a pressure from outside, direct hostility of Russia and with the ongoing war in Ukraine. There's a direct hostility of Tur Turkey and the issue of uh, Turkish diaspora issue, but also ties with the super conservative forces around Europe. There's a difficult and changing uh, unstable relations between EU and United States and between EU and United Kingdom. So these contradictions of Europeanization concept have direct impact on the security processes, on, on uh, understanding between the EU uh, member states, member nations, but also between EU and its neighbors. And uh, all these uh, differences and contestations are now used in the uh, propagandist works from different uh, rivals uh, of EU. Thank you, I will stop with that.